Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Dr. Kimper, for the very kind introduction. Um, I'm very honored to be invited and contribute to the topic uh, sharing heritage at the occasion of the European Year for Cultural Heritage. Today, my topic is European World Heritage Not Far From China. And the picture I choose, I hope most of you have already visited the site, uh, it's called Ch uh, Chinese Halls uh, in Sanso Sea Park, which is not far away from here. Um, this is a part of the UNESCO World Heritage in Germany um, called Palaces and Parks of Potsdam and Berlin, inscribed in 1990. This is a very good uh, uh, representation of uh, chinoiserie in 18th century, which reflects the curiosity or fantasy of Chinese culture around 200 years ago. Um, and this is not the only example that you could find of the Chinese elements in European world her uh, cultural heritage. You could find actually many of the Chinese elements like porcelain, silk pieces, and also architecture and landscape elements in European uh, heritage property. And likewise, you also can find many European elements in Chinese cultural heritage sites. And in this perspective, I would like to see that China is not far away that from European culture, because we have the dialogues, a communication, exchange of culture long time ago. Uh, but before I jump into my topic of European world heritage, I cannot help wondering myself, what is Europe? This question also being raised by Dr. Klimper in the morning session. And if you ask me what is Europe, my first concept, the first concept to jump into my mind, probably like some of you also, is European Union, which is established uh, in 1958, including 28 countries. But if you ask me what is more concrete about Europe, I probably will think about Euro, the currency we're using, which actually come into being not too long ago, in 2002. Um, but if you ask a Chinese, what is Europe? They probably think about, is that something different from Schengen area? This is a Schengen uh, border-free area established in 1995. So all this political, economic definition of Europe, is that true? Is that only part of Europe that we're talking about? So I would like to understand a little bit better from the physiographic point of view what is Europe. I'm a wiki lover, so I ask Wikipedia. <laughs> and I got this map which can explain quite well of this uh, transcontinental territory between Europe and Asia. The green part is a traditional European, Europe. And this light blue part is actually a trans continental area normally belongs to Europe. And this dark blue part is a transcontinental Asian territory. So this is give us a very good background to understand exactly what is Europe, as Europe is a northwest peninsula of the large landmass of Eurasia. And then it rose more interest for me to understand what in culture perspective to define Europe. So I took a look at a, a tourism industry, which has also been stressed the importance uh, of uh, as a very uh, strong economy uh, components all over the world um, by our speakers in the morning. Um, this year is a European year for cultural heritage, and, but 2018 is also a year for EU-China tourism year. So maybe it's a good opportunity we can take a look of how tourism industry look Europe in their uh, professional lens. So I took the database from the China Tourism Academy together with two biggest Chinese uh, um, tour operators. And this is a top 10 most visited countries in Europe, according to the number of Chinese visitors in the first half year of 2017. So we can see that it's including Italian, France, 
Germany, UK, Switzerland, this traditional Europe countries, but also Russia, and then Spain, Portugal, but also Turkey, and Czech Republic. So in this way, I think from culture industry point of view, the Europe is much inclusive and much broader than most of the econ economic or political definition of Europe. And then I also very interested look at the, the data from the German National Tourism Board because uh, European, Europe is uh, one of the most popular destinations for tourists. So I take example of Germany. You can see that most of the visitors to Europe are visitors from Europe. There is only one small portion of visitors that are coming outside of Europe. Statistically, it's more than 80% of tourists are coming from Europe. U.S. contribute to 6.2% and China contribute only 2.9%. So in this sense, I will see there is a big potential that we could bring China closer to Europe through the sharing heritage, through tourism industry. And then let's take a look of uh, European World Heritage, which is in the context of uh, UNESCO World Heritage Convention adopted in 1972. It is one of the most popular and universally adopted uh, international principles and guidelines. In their definition, Europe is divided into four sub-regions, the Western Europe, the Mediterranean Europe, the Nordic and Baltic Europe, and also the Central, Eastern, and Southeastern Europe. Together, we have 49 uh, state parties in the definition of uh, world heritage. If we take a look at the numbers, there are actually 476 world heritage properties located in Europe. Altogether, we have 1,092 um, of the year uh, 2000, to the year of 2018 altogether. So Europe itself almost have half, 50% of world heritage properties. And Italian, Spain, France, Germany, and UK have altogether 200 world heritage properties, which five country accounts for 20% almost world heritage property in the world. That's no wonder make Europe as one of the most popular and important destination for tourism, also for cultural resources. So clarify a little bit of the context um, of the cultural perspective of Europe. I like to sh uh, share with you some of the cases and then try to get some links, interlinks between Europe and China and also within Europe. If you ask me what is the most iconic, most typical heritage type in Europe, without any doubt, I will see church and cathedrals. And from the World Heritage List, you, you can find 89 World Heritage properties in their names is including church and cathedral. Not mentioned many other type of World Heritage properties like historic towns, cities, or monu group of monuments, they also including churches. So there is a high, very high number of churches and cathedrals is listed at World Heritage site. Um, churches and cathedrals have different type of uh, um, expressions like uh, Romanesque, Gothic, Baroque, Renaissance. Here I only give you example of Gothic cathedrals or church, which is normally built in 11th to 13th century. And in the left corner, you can see um, the Notre Dame Cathedral in Tunai in Belgium, the famous Cologne Cathedral in Germany, these two located in the Western Europe. And in the middle upper part is a cathedral, a casa und archivo de India, Indias in Sevilla, in Spain, which is located in the Mediterranean part of Europe. And the lower part is a church of Barbara at Sedlik, located in Czech Republic, which belongs to the eastern part of Europe. And then on the upper uh, right one is uh, 
Roskilde Cathedral, located in Denmark, which is in the north part of, cathedral, uh, north part of Europe. So all these Gothic cathedrals are spreading in different sub-regions of Europe. They share a lot of similarities, but each of them are individual piece of art adopted to the local context, use local material. This is the same if you think about in the counterpart of China, we don't have so many cathedrals, but we have many temples. And our temples also, they share in some similarities in the order of the space, but every individual temple is individual piece of art to reflect in their own construction technology, their own ideology about uh, um, their religion. So the religious um, monuments and buildings have played a very central role in the evolvement of civilization in both Europe and China. I didn't take many, uh, choose a picture from temples, but uh, in the World Heritage List, you can find at least three Chinese World Heritage, including temples. Um, and if you're interested, I could share with you some pictures later. And the second most representative uh, World Heritage uh, in Europe, I would say it is medieval world cities and town. Uh, there are more than Around 40 of the World Heritage properties are these 40, uh, fort, uh, fortified cities built in the medieval time from 5 to 15 centuries on this, uh, against the sea or in the land for the purpose of military defense. The upper part, um, it's uh, the very uh, famous historic old town of um, um, Dubrovnik. Uh, in, located in Croatia. It was built in 13th century and was destroyed, heavily damaged, I will see, uh, in 1990s because of armed conflicts. And uh, the lower corner, lower left corner, is a famous historic um, fortified city of uh, Carcassonne in France. This is built in the pre rome period. And if you learn, study architecture history or conservation, you will also know this size because it's very famous by the restoration work done by Villa Le Duc, who has a um, very profound um, uh, impact on the conservation um, theory and practices. Um, in China, we also have the medieval walled cities and towns. One example I'm giving you now here is the ancient city of Pingyao, which is also a world heritage uh, property in China. It was built in 14th century and continues for five centuries. They built the city wall to protect the Pingyao city at that time because it is a very important city for trading and banking. This is only one example. In China, we have a, also a quite comprehensive protection system for historic cities and towns. As, uh, last year, as of last year, there are 132 historic cities and towns are protected at national level. There is a huge portion of them are also um, protected with the city walls. So there are similarities uh, uh, from the medieval walled cities and towns, and also challenges. There is a big challenge right now, not only in China, I think also in Europe, we discussed a lot how to regenerate historic cities and towns, how to incorporate the historic cities and towns in the overall regional development. There are quite a good discussion and exchange between France and China, um, between two very famous uh, associations, but I think this is also a very interesting topic that we could bring the whole Europe together with China to seeking some synergies and solutions that we could protect historic cities and towns, but at the same time regenerate them, to incorporate them into a more wide uh, range of development. And one type of heritage I cannot forget, this is a palace. The palaces um, for kings, for empires, for royal families, and as being discussed uh, in the morning of, in this Tsutish project. Um, the palaces are normally a symbol of power. 
a symbol uh, of central power especially, they epitomize the highest level of architecture, artistic, and landscape achievements of that period. It serves also as main attractions for tourism, for uh, culture-related industries. And I found the topic which has been discussed in the morning, Tsutish, is a very genius idea. They bring drinks and food into the palace. It can be shared in a more um, interesting way with the public. Um, so there are some uh, very good examples of the palaces in, in Europe, the famous Versailles and uh, the royal palaces and Casta and the Grand Petershof Palace in um, St. Petersburg in Russia, and the Royal Domain of Dortingholm Palace, which is still the home of the Swedish royal family. Um, and this one I, will see, uh, I can point to you. Uh, there are also a Chinese village inside of the compound. So um, we don't have many palaces in China because China has more centralized administration for a long history. But I can also share with you two examples in the World Heritage List. One is a summer palace um, in Beijing. Um, it was considered as a masterpiece of Chinese landscape garden with more than 300 royal garden uh, architecture. And the other one is a forbidden city which is a Chinese imperial palace for 24 empires, started from middle of 14th century until early 20th century. It covers an area of 7.2 square kilometers um, with a 10 meter city wall to protect them and a 52 meter wide of moat. Um, what I want to see that in the German counterpart, we have this uh, European year, we have this interesting project called Sutish. In China, Forbidden City also launched lots of campaigns um, in promoting their palaces, their collections. And you can, if you're interested, you can find one documentation called Masters in the Forbidden City, which is a very popular um, documentation in China, commercially, huge success. So people rose a lot of interest of normal people to see how this so-called um, cultural heritage doctors, they repair their, um, the collections, they repair the architecture buildings in very details. And they also have a very interesting promotion, uh, especially for young generation. They designed a lot of very interesting cartoon images uh, of, of our, all our empires or empress. So just to promote this, uh, um, cultural heritage for young generation. So there are also kind of a, um, interesting dialogues we can build between palaces in China or palaces in Europe. So to have some joint efforts to promote this heritage. One of a very successful exhibition was made in Forbidden City last year was about um, royal jewelries. They bring um, a collection of royal jewelries from, uh, um, from the whole Europe and then exhibit in the uh, Forbidden City. It is a huge success and you have to have really a long queue to get into the exhibition. I think some of the exchange of culture always being very interesting and sparkling and uh, can generate um, different channels of, uh, of in joint uh, points for uh, further development of these two areas. Then the last um, type I would like to introduce here is called a transboundary world heritage in Europe. That is a more concrete link um, of heritage properties in Europe, the culture links in Europe. What is transboundary? Um, from this name, we can understand it's not a one identical, well-defined heritage properties. The, pro the heritage is composed of uh, different individual components, but they share in some similarities and they compensate each other to express the outstanding universal value of the property. In Europe, you have more than 20 transboundary world heritage property. The one example I'm going to give you here is a Struve geodetic arc 
which is actually one of the largest transnational property in Europe across 10 countries. So this is a joint effort of 10 countries in Europe. It is uh, named after a very famous astronomer, Friedrich Georg Wilhelm Struff. And he invent invented this uh, um, survey methods called uh, triangulation. We can see many of the triangles here. They're trying to determine the size and the shape of the world. So this, is, this transboundary world heritage is an extraordinary example of a scientific collaboration among scientists uh, of different countries and different monarchs, um, how they contribute together to a scientific purpose. The last property I'm going to introduce you, it's a very concrete link, linkage between China and Europe. It's called Silk Road. Silk Road, it's, uh, um, many people attribute, um, um, uh, uh, give credit uh, to MV Zhang Qian in the second century BC as he opened the first road from China to West um, due to a diplomatic mission. And then it's developed, since then it, it developed slowly across the Eurasia. There are many documented uh, evidence, especially for diplomatic and religious mentions and trips. The most famous one from China to Europe, to the West, is a um, pilgrimage to the West in seven, seventh century by the monk Xuanzang, which also be interpreted into a very famous novel. Um, and the most famous one from West to China, I could say, is Marco Polo in the 13th century. But besides that, um, there are many other documented adventures of uh, Europeans and Chinas go along this uh, Silk Road. Actually, the name of the Silk Road only came into uh, very late in the middle 19th century. It's called the Die Seitenstrasse by a German geography called Baron von Richtenhofen. In 19th century, it's also um, a very important period for the development of Silk Road because it rose a lot of interest, uh, um, interest among archaeologists among some of the commercial um, uh, um, explorers and also scientists to go through the Silk Road and they lead to a lot of important archaeological discoveries and, and also scientific debates of this uh, um, communication between China and Europe. So this road is a uh, um, Actually, the initial part, which is called the Roots Network of Chang'an Tianshan Corridors, has been listed into the World Heritage uh, List in 2014. Um, this, is only, this is covered around 5,000 kilo, kilometers, but the whole Silk Road is stretched over 8,000 uh, 8, uh, kilometers, and this is one of the most long-lasting interchange among the civilizations and the cultures uh, uh, across the Eurasia countries. And, and I would say if we could bring this good spirit of sharing heritage and uh, promote the communication, we will not only bring a better understanding and mutual respect to different cultures, but it also serves us to promote our common prosperity, prosperity and peace in the long term. So thank you very much for the attention.